All right, it looks like we are live. I'd like to thank Daniel Biss for joining us tonight, former state senator and former gubernatorial candidate. Um, I know that you're doing a lot of important work. You continue to educate around the state and are involved in clean energy right now. So mm -hmm. tons of great stuff. And I really appreciate you taking the time this evening to have a chat about healthcare. Uh, thanks so much for including me. Thank you for running. Thanks for being out there fighting. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. All right. I am going to share some questions with you, things that I've come across um, through conversations with people, things I know are on people's minds. Um, mm -hmm. Appreciate your feedback from your experience and your knowledge on policy as it relates to healthcare. Um, so I'd like to start off by first differentiating between state and national policy and, and what the difference, you know, what we can do differently. Um, I think there's a pretty wide misconception about how healthcare costs and accessibility can be affected by legislation at the different levels. Um, I know it can be frustrating when legislation happens at the state level and we don't all benefit from it. Um, right. So break down for us, um, maybe using recent examples and what these differences look like and how we can work on positive change at the state level. Sure, it's, it's a great question with an annoyingly complicated answer. So let me just start by naming the reality that this is not, there's not sort of a clean, simple way of talking about it. The, mm -hmm. the one simple thing to say <clears throat> is that Medicare is a federal program. <clears throat> so Medicare is health insurance coverage for mostly anyone over the age of 65. And that is paid for through a payroll tax that you send to the federal government and it's run by the federal government. The benefits are determined by the federal government. The reimbursement rate to physicians and other providers is determined by the federal government and the state is just, it's not our, our deal basically. Everything else is way more complicated. So for example, uh, the Medicaid program is the kind of next largest, absolutely critical government program to provide health insurance essentially to a lot of people in this state and in this country. That is a complicated hybrid of a state and federal program. So the state makes a lot of decisions about who's eligible and who isn't and what kind of you know philosophy there is of how we pay for it and how much we pay for it uh, but the federal government kicks in a significant portion of the costs and then also has a lot to do with making rules because of course they're kicking in a portion of the cost so that's like one one example another really important example is insurance regulation. Um, so there again, both states and the federal government regulate insurance companies. So like, for example, let me, let me talk about a bill that I actually passed um, and incredibly got made into law, even though Bruce Rauner was the governor at the time. This was a bill that was passed shortly after Donald Trump became president that said, listen, whatever happens on the federal level, even if they, you know, repeal the whole Affordable Care Act or, or, you know, otherwise mess with it, in Illinois, you'll still be protected in terms of having health insurance coverage, even if you have pre-existing conditions. Mm, okay. So that's a law that wasn't on the books before. Then the feds passed it. It's part of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And then when we realized that Obamacare might go away and we thought we ought to keep that, we passed it also on the state level, which by the way meant we could have passed it all along on the state level and probably should have done that 40 years ago, but, but didn't. So things, another example, um, there was a very controversial, uh, in my humble opinion, very important uh, law that was passed a few years ago that says that um, Medicaid, the state federal partnership uh, has to cover reproductive care. Mm -hmm. That's a state decision. Obviously the federal government has made kind of opposite decisions about public funding for abortion, but that's that's a state level decision. And so, so a lot of these decisions could be made at the state or federal level. If the federal government wanted to totally overrule the state, they could, 
But if they just don't say anything, then the state has some leeway. And so things like determining what kinds of services must be covered in a, in a health insurance program, that's the, something the state regulator and the state law gets to decide. Uh, determining what services are covered by the Medicaid program, the state tends to get have a lot of leeway on that, determining what kind of, um, you know, what kind of uh, reimbursement rates providers get. I want to give you one more example in this long, complicated, meandering response, because it's, again, annoyingly complex, but super important. Mm -hmm. The structure of Obamacare was basically this. It said, everyone's got to be covered. That was the so-called individual mandate. Lots of people, it said, will get covered by Medicaid. So if you don't make too much money, basically, you're going to get covered by Medicaid, this state, federal, government partnership insurance program. And so tons, millions of people got Medicaid coverage under Obamacare um, across the country. But then it left a giant hole of people who didn't have employer health insurance and didn't qualify for Medicaid. And then the question is, what happens for them? And it sets up this thing called an exchange, which is supposed to be a kind of simple marketplace to allow people to shop easily on a government website for a private insurance plan, and then maybe get a significant tax credit to help you pay for it. Now, the way the law was written on the federal level, what it basically said is, hey, states can set up their own exchange mm -hmm. if they want to. Yeah. But if they don't, the federal government will set up a kind of a catch-all exchange for the states that just don't feel like they're up to it on their own. Right. Most blue states set up their own exchange. In fact, almost mm -hmm. uh, almost all states where Democrats were in control set up their own exchange because they felt like, hey, we've got our own kind of values and principles and we know how to regulate our insurance companies already. We don't want to just have a race to the bottom, lowest common denominator thing where there's going to be more and more services tossed out of the mix. We want to have control. Yeah. Illinois didn't. Illinois did not do that, unlike most blue states. And that means that we're kind of much more at the mercy of the federal government at actually administering the part of Obamacare that applies to all the people who don't have employer health insurance and don't get Medicaid. Yeah. I thought that was a mistake at the time. I still think it's, it was a mistake. I was, you know, when I was in the legislature, I, I pushed for us to create our own exchange. I lost that battle, unfortunately. And I, I think in retrospect, a lot of people wish we had done it differently. Right. That's good to know. I appreciate all that insight. And I, obviously it's, it's all very complex and never, Never simple answers when it comes to healthcare in the United States, for sure. No, we choose not to make it simple, unfortunately, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so my next question is related to Medicaid, which you touched on a little bit just now. Um, and I actually curr currently work as a patient intake coordinator at a psychology practice. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the most frustrating and heartbreaking things that I've run into there is the number of people who are on Medicaid who call looking for counseling services yeah. uh, that we have to turn away because as a private practice, we don't take Medicaid. Um, we do have a list of practices that are in network for those people that we share, um, which is apparently uncommon to even mm. offer that much to people because I'm usually met with huge levels of gratitude for just sharing that wow. list with them because they've become so frustrated and trying to find care. Um, so it seems like the hurdles of credentialing and the low reimbursement rates or the relatively low reimbursement rates um, for Medicaid have contributed to a lack of resources for the 2.9 million Illinoisans that are on Medicaid. What can we do at a state level to improve these services and the accessibility for those people? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, just want to agree with you about the problem. It is a very real problem. Um, in general, the more rural the area mm -hmm. and the more special the care being sought, the mm -hmm. worse it tends to be. Right. So, you know, like if you're looking for, uh, you know, a general practice, like a pediatrician in Chicago who's willing to take Medicaid. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier. If you're looking for a brain surgeon in rural Southern Illinois who's willing to take Medicaid, it's a whole different different kettle of fish. Um, and so let's just walk through this for a second, right? So, so, so Medicaid or Medicare, they function a lot like a private insurance program where if, you're, if you participate in 
Medicaid, then Medicaid, which is to say the government, says to a doctor, doctor, if you provide this medical service to this patient, we'll give you this much money. And, you know, that discussion, that fight between whoever's paying mm -hmm. and whoever's providing is like one of the key friction points in American medicine. And it's way more complicated in America than in most countries that are prosperous yeah. and highly economically developed like us because there is Medicare and Medicaid and five bazillion different insurance companies. And it's, it generates a lot of confusion and miscommunication and paperwork and garbage. So what Medicare does, remember Medicare has got, you know, tens of millions of members. This is people over 65 across the country. What Medicare says is we can afford to offer a lower reimbursement rate. We can offer to pay physicians and other providers less than a typical private insurance company would because we've got so many people who are Medicare recipients that the providers can't really afford to just turn us all away. And that works, which is part of why Medicare is such a darn good program that they're able to negotiate effectively and bring down prices. And it, it's a very efficient thing. Hmm. So Medicaid sort of similar to Medicare, tries to keep the rates low. But Medicaid has an individual state Medicaid system has fewer members than Medicare, typically at least. And the rates tend to be way lower, yep. way lower. And so they get down into that low level where a lot of providers just say, we're, we're not interested. And so you run into this problem. Now, first thing to say, setting the rates is something the state does. This is not coming to us from Washington. This, unlike many other things, is not Donald Trump's fault. Mm -hmm. This is a, a problem that's existed in Illinois for a long time, very low Medicaid reimbursement rates. We could increase them, but of course that costs money. So that, that's the first thing. It's just the simple issue of the rates. The, the more complicated discussion is about the whole scheme by which we reimburse providers through Medicaid. And, and there's been a dramatic shift in recent years away from what's called fee-for-service reimbursement to what's called managed care or capitated reimbursement or what used to be called HMOs basically. Mm -hmm. and, and the basic idea here is a sensible idea, which is to say, if you're just saying to providers, we'll reimburse you for whatever you do, mm -hmm. then it's in their incentive to just keep on prescribing more drugs, ordering more tests, doing more procedures, getting reimbursed and reimbursed and paid and paid and paid. And maybe that's not actually in the best interest of the patient. Instead, the philosophy goes, hey, let's pay a certain amount of money per patient to an organization that can coordinate all the medical care. So we have investment in preventive care on the front end by somebody who's going to actually benefit financially by all the health benefits the person gets by having preventive care on the front end. So the, the idea is instead of Medicaid writing a check to a provider every time another procedure happens, Medicaid writes a check to a middleman, a bigger check, and that middleman has that big pot of money to, to kind of dole out to um, provide care for, for uh, the, the actual patient. And it's then in their best interest to keep the cost down over the long term and still invest in preventive care and so forth. So we've made that transition for giant chunks of Illinois Medicaid. And, and the problem is you're now creating this third party private entity that's standing between the Medicaid program run by the government, the provider mm -hmm. and the patient. And sometimes it works well and sometimes it works catastrophically poorly. and we just need to make sure that we're designing systems that are actually about the patient, right? Right. Not about the theory, not about the textbook, not even primarily about the bottom line. You got to watch the bottom line too. Right. But they need to primarily be about the patient. And I worry we've gotten away from that in Illinois. It does feel like it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was super insightful. I appreciate that. Um, my next question pertains to the LGBT plus community. I know mm. Illinois has made great strides in recent years um, with equality for LGBT plus people, um, but healthcare seems to be an area where that's lagging behind. And I did um, speak recently with a, um, a person who works in that field and 
they express great frustration with um, the way healthcare in Illinois has really done a disservice to that community. Um, access to medical professionals that have knowledge and expertise in treating LGBT plus people is just paltry at best. Yeah. Um, medical practice forms don't give options beyond the binary um, gender designations for the most part, at least from what I've seen and heard. Yeah. And many, many people in that community simply don't see their medical professional because they've had negative experiences or they don't feel welcome in the offices. Yeah. So what more can we do um, at the state level policy legislative wise um, alongside pro probably improving training for medical professionals, but also requiring inclusive practices um, of the medical um, community? So what else can we do? Yeah, I mean, this is a really, really big one. Um, and, you know, I appreciate that you're talking broadly about the LGBT uh, plus community. Um, I think, the, as you alluded to when talking about the fact that so, me, so much paperwork in the medical field is binary, I think we're especially experiencing real challenges for the trans community, challenges of access to necessary physical and mental health care that is specific for the needs of that community, and then access to sensitive care from providers that's about all their other needs. Um, you know, if you're, you know, nine years old and you go to your pediatrician and talk about using different pronouns, even if you don't go to that pediatrician for uh, guidance about uh, hormone blockers or input about eventual surgical interventions or any of the other therapies that some trans people uh, ultimately determine they need, even if you're just there for an annual checkup and shots and your physician isn't willing to use the correct pronouns, you just lost your access to healthcare or else you've obligated yourself to undergo an enormously, enormously um, damaging to your mental health experience in order to receive basic physical health care. Mm -hmm. It's really a problem. So the thing that I just talked about, that is what you said, that's training, right? It's training and, and more visibility for the community. Um, and, and that may not be primarily a government thing. You know, I think when it comes to, and I know just to, to, to people who haven't grappled with this personally, it may sound small, but I, I can assure you it's, it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. When it comes to just pronouns and appropriate gender markers on paperwork and government st structuring its bureaucracy in a way that tells people we see you and respect you for who you are as a member of our community. We're not gonna try to shoehorn you into a box you don't fit into. There's been real improvements. In fact, just I think two days ago, the Illinois Department of Public Health put out guidance uh, creating a non-binary gender marker uh, for birth certificates. That's 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 really really uh, important, and that mm -hmm. that's something that we tried to pass as a law for a long time and couldn't get done. And and now they've they've just they've just gone and and done it. Um, the governor um, created a task force to really comprehensively study uh, as it imp is impacted by both the education and healthcare systems the needs of trans and non-binary youth. Um, and, you know, I just think we need the voices who are most affected, which is to say trans people, especially young trans people, especially trans people of color and doubly especially young trans people of color mm -hmm. to be at the table and explain the ways in which the world that we live in has been built to tell them you are not welcome here and educate those of us who are privileged enough to play a role in structuring our society, what it's gonna to take to build a society that on the contrary says, we're really glad you're here. And we're gonna to listen to you tell us who you are. We're not gonna tell you who you're supposed to be. So it's, it's, not, it's not a simple bill that you can pass, but there are absolutely steps that government can take. And those steps are also about leading and educating other key institutions in society to come along with us. And yeah. that's where government really matters, right? I mean, if, if the state government that's responsible for Medicaid payments says, okay, we don't really get to pass a law about this, but 
healthcare providers, we really think you ought to do this and this and this and this to properly respect and see and include all people in Illinois. Mm-hmm. Healthcare providers wanting to be able to continue to get reimbursed are going to be likely to participate in that kind of reform. Yeah, and that would be great to see. Yeah. I, I'm really hopeful that we're moving in the right direction and that we will continue to as long as we're paying attention and being intentional um, in our actions in Illinois. I think things are changing, you know, and they're not changing fast enough, but they're changing fast. And one thing, one consequence of those fast changes is there, there are really wonderfully robust communities of mm-hmm. people who, who have formed around advocacy around these issues. And so, you know, it, 10 years ago, a parent of a trans kid might be totally on their own and looking for um, truly appropriate, inclusive, affirming care. Mm-hmm. Now a parent of a trans kid has uh, organizations, partners, known friendly providers, and then big, big, big groups of parents who might say, hey, lucky you, my kid's three years older than you. I figured this stuff out. Here's where you can go. Yeah, that's a great support to have for sure. Um, so my next question relates to the Affordable Care Act, which you spoke to a little bit earlier. Um, with the ACA being challenged and threatened by those who believe access to health care is not a human right. What can be done at the state level to provide protections for people with pre-existing conditions? And you already addressed that we do in Illinois. Um, young people that need to stay on their parents' insurance and the myriad other ways that the ACA protects and provides health care insurance for so many Illinoisans. Yeah, so um, the it's a really hard problem. So some of the things, some of the regulatory things we can just do. And so I mentioned the pre-existing condition thing, we did that. And actually the ability of young people to stay on their parents' insurance until the age of 26, I think that was done a long time ago in Illinois, long before the ACA even, if I remember correctly. Um, And so one at a time you can take on these regulations. Another thing that we could do to strengthen the ACA in Illinois is to set up our own exchange so we're running the the actual health insurance system and marketplace and not trusting the federal government, which depending on who's in power might be very, very untrustworthy. But I have to tell you, the other part of it is the federal government does provide a bunch of money for healthcare provision in Illinois through the ACA. For example, one thing we kind of danced around but didn't quite say explicitly is that the ACA says, hey, lots more people are eligible for Medicaid. Mm-hmm. But by the way, those new people, instead of having to split the cost 50-50 with the federal government, mm-hmm. the state pays almost nothing and the federal government picks up almost the full cost. Mm-hmm. If the ACA went away, that that could go away as well. It would be morally repugnant for the state to just walk away from the commitment to cover the That's million right. plus people who are covered under that Medicaid expansion. But you know, it also costs money. And so we need to be, and I, and, you know, I'm very hopeful that the outcome of the 2020 election will put the ACA in safer condition, but in any moment where either because of federal legislative action or federal judicial action, we're at risk of seeing the ACA fall, we gotta be prepared to put a whole bunch of new state money into Medicaid. Otherwise you're gonna be throwing tons of people off of their insurance coverage, which is obviously, in my opinion, at least a total non-starter. Definitely. Yeah. Well, it's good to, to know that and to be aware of keeping, keeping an eye on that for sure. Um, so this next question is about transparency and costs, healthcare costs. Mm. <laughs> I've seen and heard talk of addressing rising costs associated with healthcare um, and the lack of transparency regarding these costs through the creation of a state review board, like a cost review board. Yeah. Do you see this as something that would work in Illinois? And circling back to the question regarding breakdown between state and federal legislation and policy, would something like this actually have an effect on all Illinoisans or would it be limited? So the underlying problem <laughs> Mm-hmm. is that historically the insurance industry has been incredibly powerful in Illinois. And mm-hmm. so efforts to really rein them in have been watered down or have been unsuccessful altogether. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people don't think of a 
kind of a blue state run by Democrats is one where the insurance industry would be so powerful. But let me tell you, when I went toe to toe with the insurance lobby and the insurance companies in Springfield, they were tough opponents and they, <clears throat> they were able to, to get a lot of what they wanted. Hmm. So there's two parts of your question. One is technical and one's political. The technical question is what's the right way to deal with the fact that prices are totally non-transparent, mm -hmm. that they're rising and it's very hard to understand why, that often you, the patient, don't really understand what you're going to have to pay and it's you don't have the time to devote the, you know, the energy it takes to learning that. You know, <laughs> so, so there's like what are the technical solutions to that? And then there's politically how do you get it done? I mean, my philosophical belief is that the whole system is way too complicated, way too fragmented. If you put everybody in a single system like Medicare, mm -hmm. then it would be way more transparent, way more efficient, and way cheaper to cover everybody. But but that's that's you know not something that is probably going to happen tomorrow in the state of Illinois. Yeah, um, you could institute a review board like the one that you've talked about. Certainly, the federal government again, this is not something the state could do, but the federal government. Uh, could be far more aggressive in um, mandating real uh, price transparency, both to insurers and to providers. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, not to be a broken record, but if Illinois had a state exchange, we would have a better clearinghouse for regulation of our uh, of our system. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, I don't think the hard problem here is the what's the right technical configuration to crack this code, I think the hard problem is how do you beat the insurance companies that just don't want you to know what they're pocketing? Mm -hmm. And you know, the answer to that, let's be honest, it all happens, you know, on Tuesdays in November, right? The answer to that is elect people who are not mm -hmm. going to be accountable to the insurance companies, but are going to be accountable to their voters. Because here's the other thing about this. You know, I'm, I'm a really progressive guy. I believe in single payer healthcare and all kinds of other things that I'll, I'll readily admit, plenty of Republicans just don't believe is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to a typical Republican, not a Republican uh, in the legislature, but like a regular Republican in the world, they believe in price transparency. They see the costs of healthcare are spiraling like crazy. And they know that we, the consumer, have very little power that there's these massive, massive growing kind of conglomerate providers and giant insurance companies that kind of have us under their thumb. And a legislator who can go to Springfield and not be under the thumb of those organizations and instead be responsive to her constituents mm -hmm. is the only way that you can actually start to beat back the insurance industry and do what's right. Take action on that for sure. Yep. Very true. I um, I don't know who I was referring to by such a legislator, but you know. <laughs> um, so we did get a couple questions um, online. So I'm going to mm. throw a couple of those in here before I ask my next question. Um, one person said, what impact, if any, do you think COVID-19 will have on the healthcare system in the United States? And well, that one, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. That actually feeds right into one of my, my last questions. So go ahead. <laughs> Well, first of all, let's talk about the health insurance system. Mm -hmm. uh, what COVID has done is two things at once. Number mm -hmm. one, it's created a huge healthcare problem for a lot of people, right? People have this terrible disease. They need access to care. They don't know if they have the disease. They need access to testing. It's really made us realize, whoa, we need access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. The other thing it's done is it's thrown a ton of people out of work. So now we know two things. Number one, we really need access to healthcare. And number two, our employment status is fragile and precarious. What that tells me is that the bond that we've created between your work and your health coverage in America is a terrible idea because you could lose your job tomorrow and you'll still need healthcare on Saturday. Yeah, I and think so, the number is at 5.4 million now are without insurance because of... I don't remember the most recent numbers, but it's it's that ballpark. Yeah. It, it's absurd, terrifying, immoral numbers. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I hope it's taught us that the idea that your employer is the right way to get you healthcare coverage is just not sensible. It's just not the best way. So right. 
you know, again, I, I hope we, we've internalized that as we gird ourselves for the next reform battles, whether it's in the state or the federal level, that we were ready for that. So that's number one. Yep. Number two, look, it, COVID has strained our healthcare system terribly in certain places. I mean, what's happening right now in Florida is very, very scary. What happened in New York was beyond scary. What happened uh, in what's beginning to seem like it's happening in Arizona is pretty scary. There, there's what in COVID Texas. has done is what's that in Texas? Yeah, that's right. That's right. What COVID has done is demonstrate what happens when the healthcare system is pushed to its breaking point. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we can have infinite capacity, right? The solution to that isn't build another hundred thousand hospitals and have them be empty until the next pandemic comes. But it does teach us a few important lessons. Number one, a system that is so fragmented mm -hmm. is really hard to mobilize quickly, right? So different states ramped up their testing at different speeds and competed with each other mm -hmm. for testing capacity and PPE and ventilators and uh, other ICU um, supplies. Mm -hmm. That's that's not good way to run a healthcare system. That may be that kind of competitive market economics might be a good way to run the supply of screwdrivers. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that might squeeze a little bit of inefficiency out of the screwdriver manufacture and distribution system. And we'll be able to get a screwdriver for a couple pennies less over time. And if if the whole thing breaks down and nobody can buy a screwdriver for three weeks, we'll all survive. Mm -hmm. That's not how healthcare works. And right. so a greater sense of connectivity across the system is unbelievably important and a greater capacity of our government to mobilize the whole healthcare system at once when it needs to be mobilized. We had unbelievable efforts on the part of our healthcare providers. I do not think it's an exaggeration that we're all running around calling them heroes now. I think it's in fact accurate. I think it's true. But those are individuals heroically risking their health and safety to do their best for their patients in a flawed system. Right. And what I'm talking about is rebuilding the system itself. A, so we don't have to demand death-defying heroism out of our health providers as often. And B, if God forbid we have to ask that of them again, they're doing it in the best possible way so that when they're willing to take these risks, they're saving as many people as they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think two other um, issues that I had flagged in my question about mm. COVID and how it's affecting our healthcare system were related to um, the way that a lot of hospitals have actually been struggling without their the usual income from elective surgeries and other procedures. Um, I know that's negatively impacted some um, yep. nursing staff, for example. Those heroes that we need are actually some of them getting laid off and yep. having cuts when that's absolutely not what we need to see in our system. Um, and the other piece of COVID that, um, that I was going to touch on also was the, the pharmaceutical costs with, yeah. you know, get this one treatment and then it's, it's, you know, price gouging, which we see yeah. all the time. Um, yeah. Not, not helpful for anybody really. No, it's terrible. So, so um, I mean, both of your, comments are right on the money. You know, I, I think when it comes to the business problem, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hate to be so blunt, but I just think that's what happens when you treat healthcare like a business, right? You treat healthcare like a business and the hospitals have, you know, they're then in a position of trying to figure out how to run a business. And they figured out that, you know, hey, well, taking Medicaid checks to treat people who have, you know, life-threatening illnesses that doesn't make us that much money, but let me tell you, elective surgeries, that's where the real money's at. And they build a business model like that, and then we change the rules because we have to for health reasons, and it, it pulls the rug out from under them. And again, I just think it educates us as to what what kind of kind of fundamental category mistake we're making, right? Mm -hmm. When we when we treat a hospital like a business, but we feel like it's a public service, yeah. then we run into these things. Well, I think we're right when we feel like it is a public service. And I think we're wrong when we treat it like a business. And that just means we've got to restructure our policy so that we have a universal guarantee of what we view to be a public service. You know, if we treated water provision like a business, we'd wind up with real problems and having access to clean water when we, when we turn on our tap. 
And that's that's exactly what's happening with with healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and regarding drugs, yeah, I mean, look, the every time somebody runs for federal office, there's a discussion about the the question of Medicare negotiating uh, drug prices, which is just an unbelievable giveaway to the pharmaceutical industry right now that Medicare doesn't get to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are things that can be done on the state level. And in fact, there's there's now a committee that's been created in the Illinois House whose chair is a, a state rep by the name of Will Gazzardi. And that committee is, exists specifically to work on pharmaceutical pricing and on pharmaceutical price gouging. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have created some very innovative pieces of legislation to go after specifically price gouging because the state does have real regulatory authority over basically consumer issues and deceptive business practices and so forth. And so there's, there's a lot that can be done. The cost of pharmaceuticals in America is a national disgrace. It yeah. is a national disgrace. It makes no sense. It is money out of the pocket of every American mm -hmm. into the pocket of the drug companies at the more important cost of rationing needed healthcare from people. Oh, yeah, and we do it by choice because again, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like a broken record here. He says before it sounded like a broken record, but because of the power of the pharmaceutical lobby in Springfield. And let me tell you, when you go to Springfield and try to pass legislation to protect consumers from predatory pricing mm -hmm. by the pharmaceutical industry, and then it comes time to have a vote on the bill, the lobbyists aren't divided 50-50 around those tables. There's about 20 pharmaceutical lobbyists to each person who's arguing on the other side. And unfortunately, historically, they've been too successful. Hmm. That's really unfortunate. Um, another question that came in online, uh, she asks, what happens when insurance doesn't cross state lines and you're self-employed with a job that requires travel throughout the country? Well, the, when people talk about selling insurance across state lines, usually what they're talking about is a regulatory question. So, um, you know, one thing that about coverage out of state. I think, What's that? I think she's talking about coverage out of state. So Got it. Like the policy doesn't cover you when you travel out of the state. Yeah. I mean, every policy is different and, you know, the great problem with private insurance is that there's a lot of fine print and a lot of details. And, you know, there are really, really strong, good health insurance programs and there are really, really weak ones that, you know, that are so limiting when you're outside of a very thin network that you effectively can't get care, that are so geographically limiting that you can't get care if you travel. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you know the saying, right? Everybody likes their health insurance company until they get sick. And, um, you know, this is, this is the reality of health insurance in this country, that there are many, many, many situations when people who are totally happy with their insurer until they get sick, get sick and realize that they are way less covered and way less sure, to use right. the root of the word insurance, uh, than they expect it to be. And so, you know, what happens in that situation is you're in a lot of trouble and and the, the, pl the plans that are sold in Illinois vary a lot in this respect, really a lot. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's a, a time when reading the fine print is fully worth it. Yeah, I mean, this is where the, the, the idea of a health insurance exchange sounds great and the devil's in the details because the truth is that comparison shopping for health insurance is difficult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Absolutely. I've been very happy not to comparison shop for health insurance. It's great not comparison shopping for health insurance. <laughs> you know, here's my comparison shopping. I am married to a person who has a job at a university and we have health coverage. And like any more thinking than that would be over my head. Um, and so if we're going to have this system that was set up in Obamacare that expects people to comparison shop, we need to have an exchange that is very, very, very clear about what people are oh, getting yeah. and what they're not. Absolutely. All right. My second to last question I think I have here. Um, so I actually spent years, many years working as a childbirth educator and a labor doula. Mm. So as birth support um, for people who aren't familiar with what a, what a doula does. Um, so I'm really passionate about improving maternal health um, with the maternal mortality rate in the United States putting us behind 44 other countries in the world um, in the number of mothers who die around the time of childbirth every year. 
with black mothers being three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts. Um, some ideas that I've seen utilized and recommended to improve access to quality care include increasing access to midwifery and doula mm -hmm. services for low-income women. Yep. I know Oregon and I believe also Minnesota cover doula services under Medicaid um, to help improve outcomes while also lowering costs. Illinois has been lobbied for many, many, many years to license professional midwives to increase access and choice, as well as care in rural areas where there tends to be a shortage of um, obstetric care and midwifery care as well um, for expectant mothers. Other than these types of ideas, what, what legislative proposals can you think of or have you heard of that might improve outcomes for mothers in Illinois? Um, well, those certainly come to mind instantly. And, and you're, you know, you, I saw that sort of rueful grin on your face when you talked about the years that have gone into this battle around licensure of midwives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an interesting coincidence that the physicians lobby in Springfield happens to think it would be unsafe for um, natal care to license midwives. And also coincidentally, they profit by not having that business stolen by midwives. So it's it's really, really frustrating that these decisions get kind of polluted by the profit motive instead of being made based upon the basic principles of access to care. Um, you know, the other thing that's really, really critical beyond the specifics you talked about is that the, the problems, you know, you talked about the horrifying rate of, um, um, I believe you're discussing infant mortality um, in maternal, the, mortality. Uh, maternal mortality as well in the black community. Mm -hmm. You know, we have effectively healthcare deserts in this country. And that is true for all kinds of reasons, but the most profound reason comes down to how we pay for healthcare. And therefore, back to the question of whether healthcare is a business or a public service, where it's profitable to provide. And so much as we have food deserts in neighborhoods where it is le considered less profitable to open a grocery store, we have healthcare deserts in neighborhoods where it's, it's harder to run a profitable health um, provider. So, you know, there are federally qualified health centers that fill in the breach and there are public uh, facilities that fill in the breach, but there are, there are giant, giant areas of Illinois that are simply under-resourced when it comes, I'm not talking about insurance or the ability to pay, but literal access to health care providers and assets. Yeah. And if we don't fix that, then the income and racial gap in things like maternal mortality, infant mortality, are not going to change. True and sad, but yeah, something Terrible. we're working on for sure. It's something necessary to work on. And again, I think you don't, I mean, every incremental step that saves one mom's life is worth making. Yep. But I don't think you solve the problem without restructuring the system. Because a system that's driven on profit right. is going to be one that's not going to provide adequate services in the places where you're less likely to make much of a profit. True. If you're relying on the marketplace to deliver your healthcare services, you're relying on the marketplace to deny healthcare services as well. And that's mm -hmm. immoral. Mm -hmm. All right. I have one more question. I'm really grateful for your time again. I know it's gone a little bit over what maybe we'd planned on, um, but all of this is so insightful and incredibly helpful and um, definitely taking notes for when I get to Springfield. Um, not if one. <laughs> I noticed that. With I appreciated that turn of phrase. Thank you. Um, so with pharmaceutical companies profiting off of often inexplic inexplicably high prescription drug prices, what can state legislature do to help bring these costs down and into line to make them more affordable for all people in Illinois? Um, we have the recent example of the capping of insulin costs, however, that really only impacts people with state plans. Um, is there any route to state at the state level to bring down prescription drug costs? And I know you've touched on it couple of these things, but I'd like to have it more encapsulated just related to prescription drug costs. I mean, you definitely can go after gouging um, mm -hmm. and, and you can just like any other 
consumer issue. I mean, the state has the right to regulate um, on behalf of consumers, and so mm -hmm. you can go after price gouging. You can also, I mean, and again, I, I it is just one step, but you can do something analogous to this, the capping of insulin costs with for a variety of other therapies uh, and, and so forth. You know, I, I do think there are some limitations on how much we can do on the state level because our national system is so enormously overpriced and, and problematic. And, you know, things like the unwillingness of Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices means that Medicare is paying these high rates and that tends to, Medicare rates tend to create a floor for private uh, pay payers. And, and so that's, you know, that's a really, really problematic background situation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think, I think ev taking these steps, you know, like on insulin, like passing this, there was this legislation around price gouging that passed the house and then, <clears throat> and then died in the Senate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> you know, frankly died in the Senate because there was a lobbyist who was really close to the Senate president and now we have a different Senate president. So it's an opportunity maybe going forward um, in, in the new configuration. You know, every time you do that, you accomplish two things. Number one, you bring down some prices of some drugs and therefore improve some people's lives. And number two, you create a kind of a momentum, right? You create a kind of expectation that the legislature is a place where you can do this kind of work. And by the way, not only is that valuable because then next year you can do even more, it's also valuable because it starts to create some national momentum. Yep. And that changes the way Congress thinks, right? If, if most members of Congress are coming home on the weekend from Washington for their town hall meetings and hearing from their constituents, hey, my state rep and state senator passed legislation protecting me when it comes to prescription mm -hmm. drug prices, why can't you do that in Washington? Mm -hmm. Then things start to be a little bit different in Washington. And so I think I think every kind of meaningful small step on this kind of thing has real spillover effects. That's really good to hear and great to end on a positive and hopeful note, I think. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciate your time again. Thank you for joining me in this conversation. It's been incredibly helpful for me um, in guiding my thinking on all of these issues. Um, and I know that many people listening are incredibly grateful as well um, to get answers to their questions and things that they've been worried about and and to have that sense of hope too that things can change and if we vote right in November <laughs> um, we can hope to see much greater changes for people affecting their health care. Do you mind if I just give one slightly shameless plug? Sure go for it. So I, first of all I want to thank you for the conversation for the questions for the very generous patience with my long answers to some of these complicated questions. And I definitely want to thank the audience for participating and engaging and asking questions in the in the chat. I, I just, I feel better about the world that we're having a conversation like this. Definitely. But I want to, I want to stress though, that and I want to say this in as positive a way as possible, but mm. I'll just be direct. There's a lot of people running for state representative who aren't hosting conversations like this as a part of their campaign. Mm -hmm. The choice to have this conversation is a choice and it's an unorthodox choice. And it's a choice that reflects on your orientation and attitude. And I just, I think we got to remember that that's an orientation and attitude that when you bring that to Springfield, you're going to find that there's not enough of it there and you're bringing a little bit more of it will make a huge difference. You know, politics is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's a game to some people. It's a career to some people. It's um, a kind of a, a popularity contest to some people. And to some people, it's a mission about changing policy to improve the lives of everybody in their community. And you can tell whether someone's going to govern that way based on how they run their campaign. And so when Martha chooses to run her campaign by having these detailed, difficult conversations about issues that really matter for people, that tells me a lot about what kind of state rep she's going to be and what kind of opportunity is not only for this district, but for the whole state of Illinois to have someone with this set of values and intellect and approach and priorities in Springfield. And I just think we'd be doing a real mistake not to capitalize on this opportunity. And I 
very much appreciate you being willing to run. I'm excited to help you, and I hope everybody else listening will join me in helping you because it can make a real difference if you win. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for um, paying attention tonight and anybody who watches this in the future. Thank you. I appreciate you all. Take care. Thanks.